In July 2008, we saw an oil price spike 50% higher than the previous record back in the 1970s. Anyone looking at that would naturally forecast that we would see, beginning in mid-2008, the worst recession since World War II, and that it would be a long-lasting recession. And that's exactly what we've seen. Again, that's not to say there weren't other factors and aren't other factors involved. But U.S. consumer credit happened to peak just when? July 2008. And then the dominoes started to fall. In short order, uh, September 2008, of course, was a near-death experience for the U.S. And, and the global economy. Well, I would suggest peak oil is actually a bigger problem than that. It's not just about the financial markets. It's about the way we live. We have created a way of life founded on cheap energy. We don't have any alternative fuel for jet airplanes. Meanwhile, what's actually happening is the global airline industry is contracting. And it will continue to contract. And cities will lose their airports. We have developed a food system over the past several decades entirely dependent on cheap fossil fuels for running farm machinery, tractors and combines and cedars and so on, for making uh, pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, which currently we mostly make out of, out of natural gas. And then for transporting farm inputs from the factory or the, or the mine to the farm, and then transporting farm outputs, the food that farmers grow, off to Archer Daniels Midland or, or the, uh, wherever it goes to be stored and processed until it finally goes on the back of an 18-wheeler to your local supermarket. And unless those 18-wheelers are pulling up at the supermarket at a steady pace every day, that supermarket will run out of food in about three days' time. That's how long it takes to empty out the shelves without continual fossil fuel replenishment. So this is a big worry. Uh, and I don't know anyone who's concerned about peak oil who isn't concerned most about the food issue. Well, what about Canada's situation? Canada shouldn't have to worry about peak oil. After all, you've got the tar sands, right? Um, well, I was just in Alberta last month and saw the boom and bust economy that is going on there and has been going on there for some time. Uh, this is not a sustainable situation. Uh, and there are a lot of good people in Edmonton trying to do, you know, rational urban planning and so on. But how do you plan in an economy like that? It's, uh, the, the planners are just, you know, projecting this growth on and on and on. The, the, the Alberta, Alberta economy is just going to continue growing and growing and growing because that's what it's been doing for the past years, right? Well, what, what if it doesn't? Nobody's taking that into account. And then all of Canada is not Alberta. Oil exports from Alberta are keeping the value of the Canadian dollar high relative to other currencies. Well, isn't that a good thing? Well, not necessarily. That reduces the competitiveness of Canadian exports of manufactured goods and other things. So, in effect, you've got two countries going on here. One, a resource exporter, and the other, a manufacturing center, and in many ways, a resource importer. And the interests of these two parts of the country are extremely different. Meanwhile, the economies of provinces like Ontario and Quebec are highly vulnerable to oil price shocks because, you know, the tar sands aren't here and the, the uh, synthetic crude from the tar sands is not coming by pipeline to the east, it's going to the neighbor to the south. Not out of some passionate interest in oil per se, uh, that's not what gets me up in the morning to, you know, immediately turn on the computer and read the latest oil production statistics, although that's what I actually do every morning. <laughs> the reason I do it is that I'm passionately interested in the future of our species and our planet. And it appears to me that peak oil is just the leading edge of a larger limits to growth crisis. Water. It's not all just non-renewable energy sources or non-renewable materials, even renewable 
resources, we are extracting at a rate greater than the rate at which nature can recharge or replenish them. Yeah, nature makes new topsoil at a rate of about 500 years per inch, but we're, we're seeing about 25 billion tons of topsoil lost to erosion each and every year. World grain production already declining on a per capita basis and biodiversity loss, somewhere between 10 and 100 times the natural background rate. The process of evolution involves extinction. Extinction isn't something human beings invented, obviously. It's going on all the time. But have we doubled the background rate? Have we made it three, four times the background rate? No, it's between 10 and 100 times the background rate of extinction. To human beings, it all looks really good. World GDP per capita never looked better, except for the last few months, but in general, I mean, look at that. It's, it's that hockey stick or J-curve that we're accustomed to seeing with, uh, with greenhouse gas emissions. Is there a correlation here? Yeah. Uh, if we had another uh, graph that showed economic inequality among people, guess what? It would do the same thing. All of this GDP isn't being equally distributed throughout the world, among the world's people, it's being very unequally distributed. In fact, inequality's been around a long time, ever since, you know, the pharaohs and kings and so on, there's been economic inequality, in some, kind of, in, in some cases very stark, but not nearly as stark as today, when, by some estimates, 50 or 100 super billionaires control up to half the world's wealth. There's never been economic inequality on that scale. And, of course, the, the classic J-curve is just this one. We're approaching seven billion human beings at a time when we're not sure what's going to happen to the global food supply. We could go on. Uh, the number of McDonald's restaurants, uh, international tourism, number of telephones, uh, motor vehicle, you know, everywhere you look, the same kind of curve. But I want to come back to something I, w I was talking about earlier, and this, the centrality of cheap, abundant energy to economic growth. If we're approaching peak oil, and oil is, a, is the world's foremost energy source and central to global transport and food production, could it be that we have reached the limits to growth that we are seeing the end of economic growth as we've known it, basically right now, happening in front of our eyes? Well, say China is still growing at 8% per year, but China has a command and control economy. All banks in China are government banks. China can manufacture economic growth by decree, literally, and that's what they're doing. If they need to build shopping malls that sit empty, waiting for some day when there will be shoppers and products there to justify the existence of the shopping mall, they can do it, and they are doing it. For much of the rest of the world, we're seeing an economy that is treading water and in a very, very cautious way because it looks like there are some more bubbles just waiting to burst. In fact, China's economy may be a bubble economy. Planners in general, whether city planners or planners in, 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 with corporations or with the military, tend to make the same kind of assumptions. The availability of energy and important resources will not be a problem. Economic output, globalization, and technological complexity will continue to grow. There is no other option. We will not even consider a scenario that, that differs from that. And climate change will be marginal or slow in its impact on human systems. I, I challenge you to find planning documents at any level of government or in any corporation or military that differ substantially from these these assumptions. This is, uh, this is scary stuff. If, if we have, we're approaching a cliff and, and no one is, no one is driving. No one's putting on the brakes. In fact, we have people in charge still trying to step on the accelerator, saying we, we need more economic growth at any cost because that's what it takes to keep our economy going and people with jobs and, and politicians elected. We've got to have more economic growth. But how do we get more economic growth? By burning more fossil fuels. That just makes all the problems worse.